Welcome to this work session meeting of the Kingman Common Council. All work session items here. All work session items listed are for discussion only. No action can or will be taken. The primary purpose of work session meetings is to provide the City Council with the opportunity for in-depth discussion and study a specific subject. Public comment is not provided for on the agenda and may be made only as approved by consensus of the Council. In appropriate circumstances, a brief presentation may be permitted by a member of the public or another interested party on an agenda item if invited by the mayor or city manager to do so. The mayor may limit or end the time for such presentation. The first order of business on our work session tonight is read abatement, start to finish, and at the shotgun, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I am going to try to work through this. I apologize for my voice. Um, tonight, we wanted to make sure that the council understood what's happening with weed abatement. We wanted to make sure that you knew who was handling weed abatement and that you were comfortable with the policies that the council has passed that we are enforcing. And that we wanted to make sure also that if there was tweaks to the policy or issues that we kind of got feedback or we were just going to continue the weed program like we are. So we've got a lot of weeds this year. So this is a perfect topic for tonight. So uh, Mr. Eaton is going to, Chief Eaton, sorry, is going to walk you through what we're doing. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Uh, so um, as Manager Foggin has uh, indicated, that we've been asked to kind of give you a guideline of what we do with weeds. Uh, we've made some changes uh, to our weed program, uh, kind of go over some of that stuff and kind of just you know, get a little guidance as to where we're at with it. So um, historically, weed abatement has been very confusing. It's been very confusing for the employees. It's been very confusing for the citizens. Um, at one time for many years, um, green weeds and brown weeds were split up. Uh, Green weeds were handled by neighborhood services. Brown weeds, because they were more of a fire hazard, were handled by the fire department. Um, we felt, um, like you do too, I'm sure, is that it's just too confusing. Um, who, who gets the complaint? Who doesn't get the complaint? So um, we had put together a uh, committee, started with uh, some of uh, the complaint uh, processes that you'll see probably later on in a workstation um, as far as the, as the complaint uh, process, uh, the guiding of emails to the proper places where these complaints need to go. Uh, so um, we'll cover that at another work session. But tonight, we'll just kind of cover it. So what we've done, what we decided during this, uh, this, these meetings with the, um, the other departments is that the weeds need to be with one person. Um, and uh, so... Uh, we decided that uh, Building Life Safety would handle the weeds. Um, we divvied up some other, other things that other departments did and come to a really good um, conclusion on who does what. So um, I did not get a chance to change in the fire department clothes, and I thought that was okay now because weeds actually, they, they demand a little nicer dress ple uh, presence. So... Um, I want to go over a little bit. So the complaint process right now, um, the customer complaints initiated. So we work on a proactive uh, and a reactive. So we're reactive to the complaints that come in. Uh, we also work uh, neighborhood services. Um, we plan on changing to a more proactive. So where any of our staff members are out driving around, they see uh, some weeds and that kind of thing and that meet those classifications that we will start that process. Um, obviously, it's always um, our goal to get voluntary compliance uh, without going into any other court steps. Um, we like to work with people to get those kind of things done. So <clears throat> when we get a complaint that comes in through the phone, through the city, through our email, or whatever it is, that then we send somebody out to physically identify the complaint, uh, write it up. We come back in, we check it out. Um, if it is not a homeowner, or if there, it is an abandoned home, 
uh, we come back and we get the idea of, or we find out who it was, county records, and, and we make contact there. Uh, if it is a homeowner, we will actually go up and talk to them and talk to them about their, their weeds. And one thing that we found, and, and Chief DeVries can, uh, can agree with, I'm sure agree with me, is that I think a lot of citizens don't know the areas that they're supposed to take care of. Uh, alleyways, it's their responsibility to take care of their half of the alleyways, uh, even outside of their fence. And I, I just think that people don't know. And so part of our, part of this process is a very aggressive ad campaign or, or ad uh, campaign through social media and, and I'll be working uh, uh, to get that done just to give people that, that idea of that information that they need. When, when we do make contact with the property owner, uh, we obviously, again, seek voluntary compliance in a timeline. Presently, the timeline is 30 days. Uh, what we find with that is that by the time you go through any kind of court process or anything else, the weeds are now brown and possibly fallen over and it's really, you know, it goes outside of the immediate uh, attention that it needs. Uh, I've worked with Carl and his staff we're actually closing that gap to seven days, uh, trying to get that compliance earlier, much earlier uh, than the 30 days. And uh, most all of, all of these, um, these violations and everything that we do is, is driven by the uh, ordinances that are adopted by, by the city and city council. After seven days, we'll go back and we'll check the status to see if, if the weed violation uh, is better. Uh, if it's better and they're still working on it, we'll still work with the citizens to to give them a little more time and, and that kind of thing. If we see that nothing's been done, uh, which happens often, that citizens just don't do it for one reason or another, we'll, we've developed a new weed violation notice. Uh, again, still, still um, using the present ordinances. Uh, there's no new ordinances adopted for this. It's the present weed ordinances, uh, which basically this is the first step in the legal process um, of the written notices. Uh, this is a picture of it here. Um, basically, we've worked with the uh, city attorney's office uh, with, with all of the uh, information that's needed to move forward. So on the date required, we will check the status, document with photos. Uh, if they are compliant, then no further action is, is required. If the property is not compliant, uh, we take that uh, form that we just have, we send it off to the city attorney's office to begin charges or civil abatement on that. Um, uh, with that, the city attorney processed the violation uh, through the municipal court. Uh, as a criminal complaint or a civil abatement. And, and uh, Mr. Cooper, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that at that time the, the city attorney's office makes a determination whether it will be a civil abatement or a criminal complaint. Yeah, once we receive the, the, the complaint, we, it just sort of depends on prior histories, um, the severity of the violation, what goes on. And, and, and just briefly, a civil abatement is where we go through a process, get a court order that, that allows us to enter upon the property and actually clean up the weeds, basically issue a bill against the property owner and do a lien on the property, the, which can be done pretty quickly overall. We can get that knocked out in 30 days, maybe 60 at the most. Uh, the criminal complaint, uh, that's where you actually start a criminal complaint process. Part of that process could take, that can take up to four to six months. Um, and part of that process is you try and seek um, terms in any kind of plea agreement or a conviction uh, that require the, the cleaning up of the property, the suspension of fines or something along that line. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll say we, we issue a $500 fine, but all of it's suspended if you get the property cleaned up. So that's kind of briefly how that works. The civil abatement is much quicker. Uh, it, it just sort of, like I say, again, it just sort of depends on how things look. So. Okay, thank, thank you, Carl. So just a little bit uh, to fill you in on the municipal court actions, and I, and I think that it's, uh, sometimes we get comments from the public that it's their weeds, and you're gonna take me to court over weeds. And, 
and uh, and I and I get it. I agree, but it's but it's also uh, been this council's priority, uh, this this city manager's priority, along with previous council. Uh, those of you that was on previous council is to clean the city up and. While it seems very harsh, uh, it just uh, sometimes if we can't get uh, compliancy, then we have to move to those kind of a thing. Um, so the judge will actually hear the case. We actually are one of our uh, officers or one of our fire prevention people go and testify, whether it's myself or, or anybody else, prevent or present any uh, uh, pictures or anything that we've got. So the civil civil violation uh, is what Carl was just talking about, or that we'll actually we'll actually do the abatement ourselves. Uh, we'll bring it back to you guys uh, under our budgets uh, to do those abatements, do it, and then we tag the the tax or the tax rolls or the, that property with that. The criminal charges, uh, the judge charges responsibility party for the criminal charges uh, per our city code. Um, and I think that, um, Carl, and, I, and I, uh, if you could add, as far as violations, fines, and that kind of thing, and I think you just covered it just a little bit with uh, fines, um, probation, those kind of things. Yeah, uh, things underneath our city code um, allow for certain punishments depending on the, the type of uh, charge it is and i believe it's a class one misdemeanor per the city code uh which is the maximum misdemeanor this isn't going to happen but technically yeah you could get six months jail we're not putting somebody in jail for weeds but it's just one of those things but ultimately it could be a twenty five hundred dollar fine you get probation for three years again that's not going to happen you're looking at generally a minimum amount of time just to make sure that the process is taken care of and if there's a fine we generally try to suspend it as a hammer over their head to say, if you don't clean it up, then you're going to have to pay $500 and still clean up the property. So we, we're, it's not as draconian as it could be. And like I say, we don't like getting where we get. And the folks on the ground do a lot to try and talk these, these people into to complying. And ultimately, it's their choice. They don't want to comply. They know what's coming. So. And, and it is our goal, and, and customer service obviously is is top of our priorities as, as well. And and we're going to get, uh, and we do get uh, citizens, uh, maybe citizens that that don't have the means, or citizens that that can't get out there because of any physical issues, or they can't do that. And and we try to work with them. This is not a, you know, we we don't want to, we don't want to find people, get them into court over weeds. However, we need to get some stuff cleaned up. Um, a lot of the issues that we have, and as you guys know, is uh, the empty lots. Um, coming into town, some different empty lots and, and those kind of thing. And those take a little bit different uh, approach when we find the owners. And then, then we still, we kind of immediately go into the court process on that instead of giving them. Because if they're out of town owners, they're not going to come within their seven days and, and take care of that stuff. So um, more than anything, I think that's the, the little more harsher uh, things that we do there. Um, the civil abatement is that we, um, we will remove the weeds by a private contractor. Uh, we'll go through our, our process through finance as far as uh, getting prices and, and when, when that's uh, required. Uh, private contractor, um, we do different statements for for uh, courts, um, and, and including a cost of five percent for an administrative charge. Um, the responsible party is the people that were uh, we've got in court. They'll be provided with that statement of account, um, and then we have certain time periods that we have to get this stuff done per state uh, ARS. Um, it, that was kind of a quick deal. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a background. So once we do start the process a little heavier, uh, a little more proactive, uh, our intent is to kind of start with the uh, main entrances into the city, trying to clean up, uh, obviously working with ADOT in some of the areas um, and some of the city areas. Uh, some of the areas that, that we get complaints on are actually city-owned 
properties. And so, and we know that, and of course we also know the staff levels of, of planning or with uh, public works and whatever, trying to get that stuff done too. Um, once we roll this out, our goal is to uh, make it as transparent as possible uh, with people trying to work with them. But I, with any kind of new rules or change rules or rules, um, there's a chance that we're gonna get some pushbacks. And more than anything, and, and Manager Foggin and I have discussed this, more than anything, we want to make sure you guys are ready and aware of when this, this is what's happening out there. And we want to, you know, I would like your thoughts, processes that you would like to see. Uh, if there's any other questions that you have for us, it was kind of brief, but it's kind of where we're at. Um, a lot of the comments that I get in the public, um, the, it seems like the perception is definitely that it's on the city to go out and check all the areas and be in charge of this. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's really, a lot of it is on calling and making a complaint to start the process. So if you have a neighbor or something that has a mess in their yard and it's bringing down the value of the mm -hmm. neighborhood. It, it's on the it's on the neighbors to, to make that call. Is that right? Well, it, it is, and and it's and I hate to say squeaky wheel kind of thing because that's not the way we work. Mm -hmm. uh, we get right on it, but but part of this process and part of the new complaint process that IT uh, has been working with uh, Officer Reef uh, with uh, neighborhood services have been working on is going to fix a whole lot of problems uh, for the citizens that they, if they know, and I won't go into too much detail, but if they know there's a weed complaint, they push weed complaint, they tell where the weed complaint's at, they take a picture if they've got one, and it's routed to me. Uh, if there's potholes, they, they take a picture, where's it at, they, it gets routed automatically. So the public doesn't have to be calling in and being rerouted, rerouted to everybody. So, well, that's not what we do. Um, one of the other things that we do with that is that our dispatch center receives a lot of those complaints. Um, and we have created, uh, mostly Dave Reef with, uh, with uh, PD, created a kind of a flip chart that shows who's in charge of what. So we can, we can also, you know, safely guide folks where they need to be going. And so certainly being uh, reactive as soon as we get those complaints is, is super important. Uh, the proactive part is that we've got staff that's all over the city all day long, every day. And so we can, we can immediately start some of those cases. But yeah, if we, we get a few daily lately uh, from neighbors yeah. that, uh, you know, that just get tired of looking at their neighbor's stuff. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. <laughs> so did I hear you say that you're going through some kind of informational piece or Educational yeah. Public, kind of what we're yes. Yep. So our our wonderful videographer uh, in the uh, video department. So she's been gone for back and forth with some other busy stuff. So actually, starting uh, next week, uh, we'll actually be working together with Public Works PD uh, doing a video series like like uh, we like to do. So yeah. I think that would help. Right. Well, and, and we realize that people just don't know. Um, there's uh, another document that's, uh, that I, that's going to be created that we were kind of using um, this type from another city that actually has a picture of a house, and these are the things that you're responsible for. And, and I, I truly believe that 75% of the people out there that are having issues or we're talking with them, they just don't know that they had to do that. And, and I think that that's... What's that? I'm sorry. Yes. Well, well, they are, and, and they do, and, and we get that, and, and I won't speak for Public Works, but I'm sure that Rob and Jack will tell you that there's a lot of complaints that people think that we need to be cleaning that stuff up when it's indeed their, their area. <laughs> so, yeah. But the, but, the, but the information is the big part, trying to get that out there. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Um, 
Keith, thanks again for the report. We appreciate the, the information. Um, do you already have service groups calling in looking for, you know, things to do? I mean, something like this would be perfect for youth groups to clean up it, areas. And it, it absolutely would. So what the thought process is is just carry on what Neighborhood Services has done and, and try to contact some other, some other groups or something. Uh, there's more than one occasion that we have uh, some folks that just can't do it themselves. They mm -hmm. can't get out for a number of reasons and do it themselves. And we try to hook them up with, with groups that can. Uh, I would urge any group that, that would be able to volunteer or want to volunteer for these things uh, to contact me or contact the city so we can put them on a list and, and kind of help through that way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, thank you. folks. Yes, Mayor. I apologize for my, my voice. So we'll turn it over to Sid. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council. And I didn't realize Keith and I were going to match our presentations tonight, but at least we're consistent. Uh, this is going to be a discussion on a proposal to extend the term length of the mayor to Pardon. four years. Uh, this will be a discussion to consider extending the term length for the mayor from the current two years to four years, which would match the rest of the council. Uh, tonight is for the council to provide any input on this possibility. Um, and the extended term would begin with the term in 2022. Uh, part of the reason staff is bringing this to the council is the cost of running for office every two years is considerably high. I'm sure you all remember how much effort and how much money it took for all of you to run for council. The mayor has to do that every two years as opposed to every four like the rest of the council and that's a big deterrent for a lot of folks. A uh, four year term for the mayor will also provide us with some political stability on the council and it preserves that institutional knowledge. Um, as the council is aware, you all alternate those terms. If we have a new mayor every two years, that doesn't provide us with the same amount of stability and that knowledge that carries over. And a four-year mayor would also provide us with some additional opportunities for influence regionally and at the state level. Uh, previously, we had a mayor who served on the league executive board. It uh, helped us really influence a lot of... I, I'm getting signs. You need to speak well. I will do my best. Uh, previously, we had a mayor that was able to serve on the league executive board, and uh, that provided us with a lot of opportunities for influence down at the state level without us having to be there every single day. Um, but with a two-year mayor, that does make it very hard because those terms are for several years at a time, and having a two-year mayor, those don't carry over. So if our mayor is uh, voted out, then we don't get to keep that seat on the executive board. It just moves up to the next person. Uh, this is just a brief snapshot of our statewide comparison. There are currently a total of 42 uh, two-year mayors. Ten of those are not directly elected, so they are elected as a council member, and then the council comes together and elects a mayor from within. Uh, there are 49 four-year mayors, and six of those are not directly elected. Uh, again, just showing the statewide comparison, these are for the mayors that are directly elected. Uh, Kingman is up here. We're a little bit higher for a lot of the two-year mayors. Um, you'll also notice that uh, half of those that are, half of the communities that are larger than us are charter communities, and it takes a little bit more for them to make these changes than it does for a general law city. And just for comparison, the four-year mayors uh, we would be between uh, Florence and El Mirage as far as the size comparison. And you can also see where Bullhead and Havasu are. They both have four-year mayors. So the next steps, if council wishes to pursue this, 
Uh, this does have to go before the voters as a ballot measure. This is not a step that the council can take directly. Um, if the council chooses to do this, we would put together a resolution to send this to the ballot. Uh, it would come back to the council for approval in fall of 2019, and it would go to the August 4th primary election. That is a change from the PowerPoint in your packet. Uh, we just had a Senate bill that was passed on Friday that changed the date of the 2020 primary from uh, later in August to the first Tuesday in August, so it would be August 4th. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions? We don't make any decisions. So this would start in 2022? Correct. Which means that the next cycle, the next mayor would be elected for two years. Yes, ma'am. Again, and then if this went to ballot pass, it would become effective. With the 2022 Four term, years. yes. And we are seeking some head nods from the council if you would like well, this to come. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like this to come back this fall. All, to, all we're deciding on is to put a question to the voters because the voters ultimately decide this, right? Correct. And again, you would have the opportunity to finally say yay or nay this fall when the resolution came back, but we wanted to gauge the interest of the council this evening. So you're asking if we, if we, we want it to come back to council as a decision on whether to put it on the ballot? Yes, ma'am. We like that? Sure. We would like that. Okay. We will bring it back this fall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. The next, the next order of business is the Catherine Hyderite Center update. And Mr. Mearsman, you are, you are here to... Start this discussion. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, and uh, everybody from the public. Uh, at the previous meeting, I was asked about the Bullhead City and Lake Havasu City, what they do. Bullhead City contributes out of their Parks and Recreation budget $355,000 toward their senior center. Uh, Lake Havasu City does not uh, Contribute out of their parks and recreation to their lake habit, to their senior center, but they do. They their finance department said they do support other areas of the senior population. So they didn't specify exactly what that was, but and obviously we we have been contributing fifty seven thousand um, dollars. The the senior center, the Catherine Heidenreich Center, they offer a lot of numerous programs and activities for personal enrichment to the seniors in our community. They offer education opportunities, uh, computer skills, teach them how to use their personal devices, um, and, and a lot of recreation activities. Uh, it's also a great resource for medical and health screenings and things like that for the community. Um, they also bring certified tax preparers in to help anyone that's uh, with a limited income, and not only seniors, they, they allow everybody to come in and do that. And, uh, yeah, it's also a great place for the elderly to come when they have lost a significant other and just communicate with other people. So, um, Senior Services Director Deborah Doherty, she does a great job of organizing the events there and uh, giving these people recreation opportunities and to take part in. And the Board of Directors there, I think, does a great job uh, with the limited budget that they have to keep the place going. So. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Keith Adams, who's the president of the uh, Catherine Heidenreich Center Board of Directors, and give him an opportunity to share some more information with you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Mr. Adams. Well, first off, Mayor and Council, Vice Mayor, thanks for having us here. We're pretty low tech, so we don't have PowerPoint. <laughs> so, I didn't know what you guys wanted, so I have handouts for everybody that kind of Let's just give those out first and kind of you can look them over. It's a little bit of the same report that I gave Mike. Thank you. But it also has some of the other information in it. I take it you have the, the small report, kind of a snapshot that I give Mike, what's going on at the center. 
if you have that, basically, I'm not exactly sure what type of report you want, so I've kind of highlighted just some bullet points just to go through them for you. As you well know, we've been in business for about 51 years now, and it started out as a, as a barracks. I'm not going to go into all that, but right now we have about 12,000 square feet, and the one thing I really want the council to know, because you guys are all fairly new here, and I don't know how many times you've been down at uh, Catherine Einreich, not one cent did the city nor the county put into those buildings. They were all built through the funds that we've received through bequests and grants and fund drives and you name it. So we've maintained those all these years. Started out with our original building that was built after the barracks. We expanded that building, we built an annex building. So, and we maintain that. Recently, the county's been kicking in a little bit because you probably know if you've been around here long enough in about the late 90s or around 2000, they dropped their participation in the center, which was the two part-time people. The city then picked it up and we were all under parks and recreation. And as I put in my minutes, I've been with it for 33 years because I supervised them for 24 years. And I've been on the board since the day I retired in 2010. So I've been around it a long time and I know how many people go down there. You could come in and maybe see 10 people at one time, you could see 50 people at a certain program. But just going through all that, we've been working since 2013 with our staff being kind of stipend through the city and it's worked out quite well because it's given our board a little bit more control over the staff. But unfortunately, the downside of that is those three people, the two part-time and Deborah, lost their participation in state retirement and they also lost their health care but they maintain their salaries so that's that's the good part of it the bad side is those things um, we have at least 30 plus programs going on at all times and I think there's some of that information in there um, based on 2018 stats we offered around 16 and uh, 1690 class sessions we um, had over 14,000 people participate. Now that's not 14,000 individual, that's contacts, people coming into the center. We average about two to 300 people a day. They're usually there anywhere from an hour to two hours, some up to three and four. Oh, let's see, volunteers, that's a big one. I didn't put that in the report because I didn't have it at the time. Volunteers, nearly 3,000 hours a year we use volunteers. A lot of them, probably around 1,600 are through our retired senior volunteer program, which is the RSVP program, and then the other two or three people, up to five, six, seven people that work for the staff and they're not in the RSVP, another 1,300 hours. And that's for the special events, the meetings, the teas, you name it, whatever we do, the craft fairs. And as far as associations, obviously we're associated with you. We're associated with Kingman Regional, they give us some money every year to help out. They were the ones that put up a lot of the funds for the commercial kitchen that we did. Um, we're associated with the county. We sit on county land. And recently, like I said, they've been helping out a lot because up into the last two or three years, we paid for all of our repairs. We had to have a new roof. We had to have coolers. We did all that. They are kicking in some right now because each and every time that happened in the past, our funds went down drastically. And we had to start, and as we all know, the banks don't pay a whole lot anymore. So we had to start re doing some different things. We moved over to Edward Jones, and we had to be a little bit more conservative, but more proactive to try to keep that money in place. Um, we work with United Way, and uh, I think Mike mentioned tax program. We actually have two tax programs. We have a tax program that's uh, for the folks that are 65 and older. Neither of these are at a cost. And then the VITA program, which is for people that have 65000 or less a year. They can come in and get tax assistance. Uh, work with WACOG, Western Arizona Council of Governments, Medicare questions. They come in a couple of days a week. The Area Agency on um, Aging, that's where we get our Title V workers, which are, you know, bringing the people 55 and older in the workforce. I mean, I could go on. We work with the County Nutrition Center, which is right next door. We work with hospice services, Red Cross, blood drives, um, the cancer care unit. 
this group's been around for 20 plus years, and I think I saw Dorothy come in over here, and she's kind of the matriarch of the Kingman Cancer Care Unit. They've been meeting at the center for years and help out with some things, some of their members. We have Girl Scouts that have been there for years upon years. Um, Senior Corps, RSVP, Senior Angel Program. We do two craft fairs a year. We do monthly dinners that are open to the public. Uh, we have movie nights once a month. Judge Khan comes and he's our narrator and he has insight with all those movies. So I mean, there's quite a few things. We do two tea parties a year, quite a few things. And if you looked at any of the budget numbers that I proposed and showed you guys, um, our receipts projected for this year around 112,000 and our disbursements are about 114. So we're gonna lose a little money unless the market does really, really good. But if you take the 57,000 away and actually our payroll costs around 72,000 when you add in all the other things, FICA and workers comp and all that. But if you take the 57,000 away, we're gone in about 18 months because we have a little over 100,000 in the bank. But if we have to put that money out to pay payroll costs, the center will close in about a year and a half. We could not sustain ourselves. I know that's a quick snapshot of what we do, but um, that's basically what we do. Thank Any you, questions? Sir. Well, I have a comment. Two years ago, this, the then council passed this contract on in the consent agenda. And, and there was no question. And this time, there was a question. But of course, we've gone through a, a tax refill that makes us look at mm -hmm. everything. And it really does make us look at everything because we've had to close down street programs, downtown programs, and just other things that matter also to the city. That I understand, but, and I tell people that every day, because even though I'm not with the city anymore, I still maintain that. And I, I get on people every day about that. That was one of the dumbest things they ever did, is to repeal the half-cent sales tax. But, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, one, it's good to have someone to come up and tell this story, because it is obviously a great um, care to all of us, but also it gives a chance to highlight what's going on there, not just to this council, to the public. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a plus, because I I don't know about you, but I, and I said this last time, I'd like to hear about all this that's going on. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about your budget, yes, but also about the whole slew of activities and partnerships that you are engaged in. And I think that's a good positive for this city. I think it's a very good positive, and I appreciate you coming up. Oh, well, we welcome to come in here and let you know. Thank you. And against that, I would ask, are there any other comments or questions? Yes. I'd like to say something if I could. First of all, I just want to thank you for coming tonight. Oh, you're um, welcome. I, I wish you were here on the 7th. When <laughs> uh, we had that agenda, just for everybody that's here, um, what was on consent was just a five-page IGA, and we didn't have any of this information that you gave us, and I don't think that you were here to answer any questions. And so... No. Um, I, when public funds are involved, I will never vote on something out of ignorance. I want to understand. I want to be actively engaged. Um, and, and that's what I really see this as. Um, I didn't know at the time if it was 5% of the budget or 50%, which it's more like 50% of the budget. Obviously, yeah. You can see that. So, you know, um, I've had a lot of people contact me over the, the last 14 days, and I've learned a lot about it, and I appreciate it. And I do hope that, that the papers here will spotlight what you guys do. Uh, and you have my full support for the donation. I appreciate you coming. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Any other comments? Um, Mr. Adams, I would like to thank you. You do great work there. Um, Deborah Doherty, would you stand up? She is the director at this center. I got a chance to visit with her Thursday. Amazing work. And also, is Aunt Di happen to be in the audience? Deborah? Uh, she had a Okay, well, will you point her out? Because I definitely want to meet her. Aunt Di is what they call her, and she has um, a Girl Scout troop that she's held. They've held their meetings there, and they make gifts for the homebound citizens. And 
just there she's doing an amazing work too and I want to thank all three of you and everybody thank you so much awesome. and I want to point out one other person besides Debbie Bill Porter Bill Porter I I've, pardon me <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I want to point out Bill Porter. I've been on the board since 2010, since I retired from the city. Um, Bill was our longtime president, so he has a lot to do. I've been the president for, I think I'm going on four years, but Bill was president for, I don't even want to add them up, there were too many. So I have to commend our own board for being so diligent all these years because the last uh, gift we got from Letty Crocker we still have about 90% of that money over 25 years. And, you know, if it was a lot of boards that were frivolous and I don't know, I don't know what they do, but we still have pretty much what we have from 25 years ago. And we maintain that because we're so frugal. So, thank you. Mr. Okay. Yes. Any other comments? Yes. Okay. Keith, once again, thanks for coming and thanks for everybody coming here tonight to support. The, the center. Um, I know the 30 years that I've lived here in Kingman, I've always heard positive, positive things about what, you know, what is accomplished from the Katherine Heidenreich Center. And so I think it's a great thing. And of course, once again, thanks to all those who volunteer over those years and cur are currently volunteering. Um, well, I think we, we couldn't run without them. I agree. Without the volunteers, there's no way. I agree. I remember a number of years back, there was, I know Social Security used to come in and yeah. have offices there. I mean, it, it, it accomplishes and provides so much service to the community. It's a great thing. Yeah, that was a huge service that was lost to us when they pulled out. So. Unfortunately, but we, we, I, I really appreciate all the service that is done there. Well, thank thank you. you so much. And I can say that I've been there a number of times <laughs> for many number of events over the years, and I'm very aware of the contributions you make, and I appreciate it. But I have to say one of the most fun was the ballroom. Event. And I actually got up and line danced for the first time, and I'm sad to say they had a video of it. So, <laughs> um, anyway, thank you, Mr. Adams. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. We have a few minutes here, and I've asked uh, someone to. Do <laughs> I thought that since we might have a number of, uh, of people here who care about senior issues, so I've asked um, Heather Braz Brazil, uh, close enough Brazil, uh, of our senior corps to speak, because I can do that, and I've asked her to speak a few minutes on the senior corps because that's an opportunity for volunteerism and also services. So, Ms. Brassel, if you would give us just a few minutes, tell us what the Senior Corps is. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mayor Miles, for inviting me here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Heather Brazel, and I oversee all of the senior corps here in Mojave County. And um, just really quickly, as you can see in your brochure, for those of you at home, we have some in the back. Candy can get you information if you're interested. Um, we have three different programs, our Senior Companion Program, Foster Grandparent Program, and our RSVP Program. And each of those highlight different ways that adults 55 or better can give back to the community. And um, we'll start with our RSVP program, which we partner with many different organizations, one of which is the Katherine Heidenreich Adult Center. And some of our RSVP volunteers are actually here. So, hooray. Ms. Russell, you're going to have to speak into oh, the microphone. sorry. Because a lot of people at home want to hear this, oh, too, sorry. I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay. So, with our RSVP program, we help c local community organizations like um, the Adult Center, the 
Center for the Performing Arts, uh, the JABC, different organizations, our volunteers go in and help them fill their critical needs. Like the adult center said, um, you know, helping reception or whatever they need. Um, our foster grandparent program, really quickly, um, we work with youth in different capacities. So we partner with the Club for Youth, with our Head Start, um, the Blended Learning Center, um, and of course, KUSD, to name a few. So we help children get that extra support that they can grow up to be thriving in, and contributing individuals. And lastly, we have our Senior Companion Program, which helps our volunteers, um, our volunteers get paired with other adults um, who need extra support to get to the grocery store, doctor's offices, um, also if they, um, need respite care or um, we also provide companionship so those individuals don't um, become isolated and depressed and um, so there are lots of benefits to being a volunteer as well we offer tax-free stipend we offer um, mileage reimbursement we offer paid holidays and leave time we offer training um, we have um, offer supplemental insurance while our volunteers are volunteering. Um, I know I'm kind of going really quickly because I only had a couple minutes. Um, but of course, if anyone in the community needs some of our services, they can always contact me or go to one of our partners like the Adult Center um, and we can get them linked up with one of our volunteers. So I know that's it in a very small nutshell, um, but that's what we do basically because I only had a small amount of time and I'm sorry I'm fumbling. Thank but, you. Yeah. Well, that okay. sounds like it's an opportunity for seniors who want to volunteer to contact you or who need mm -hmm. the services yes. to contact you. Yes, so definitely. So I thought that was a, uh, something that the public should know mm -hmm. that the service exists and that they can contact you at... Uh, uh, and you're located at the NAU offices? Actually, we have an office in the Waycog building right here downtown okay. at 4th and Beale. Excellent. So, Excellent. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, that concludes our uh, work session agenda. So, uh, without... Any other comments or questions? I would entertain a motion to adjourn until 6 o'clock. I move we adjourn this meeting. Second. It's been motion and second to adjourn. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. We'll reconvene at 6 o'clock. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to. Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to this meeting, the regular business meeting of the Kingman Common Council. Uh, could we have a roll call, please? Mayor Miles here. Vice Mayor Lingenfelter here. 
Councilmember Mello Keener? Here. Councilmember Nelson? Here. Councilmember Scott Staley? Present. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Councilmember Waite? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I would ask everyone to stand. Is, is uh, Pastor Shaw here? Pastor Shaw? Okay. What I'd ask is that we stand for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Join me, please, in a moment of silence. Thank you. Amen. Join us in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Um, because of the extraordinary uh, attendance tonight and interest in the issue, I'm going to alter the, the agenda and the way that we en enact it this evening. And we're going to bring the vote for the Katherine Heidenreich Senior Center to the forefront, because I know you're all here for that, or at least many of you. I'd like to display for you the fact that we have received this petition uh, that is signed by a lot of very dedicated, interested people in this issue. And as I have voiced before and on social media, I think it's important to realize that there is a lot of support on the scene, uh, for the Senior Center on this council. And that it was a good thing, I believe, for us to have the presentation tonight and, it, and to demonstrate to the whole public all the valuable services that are going on at the center. Having said that, I am going to bring item 4B, because this is not a public hearing, so legally we can do this. We're going to bring item 4B to the top of the agenda, and I'm going to read it and ask the council to go ahead and consider this vote. Item 4B is Katherine Heidenreich Adult Center Agreement. The City of Kingman has had a two-year agreement to make a financial contribution to the Katherine Heidenreich Center to partially fund senior citizen services. Agreement shall be in effect from July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2021. This item was pulled from the May 7th Council agenda by Council Member Travis Lingenfelter requesting additional information, which we have received. Staff recommends approval for funding under the agreement to the Katherine Heidenreich Adult Center. Council, we've had a great deal of information presented. Uh, is there any dialogue or discussion that you would like to have or further questions regarding this issue before I entertain a motion? Then I would entertain a motion regarding uh, the uh, approval, approval of the two-year agreement with Katherine Heidenreich Adult Center. Madam Mayor, since it was I that uh, pulled the item originally for more information, I'd like to make a motion that the council approve funding under the agreement to the Katherine Heidenreich Center. I have a motion. Is there a second? I second it. I have a motion and a second to approve the contract for Katherine Heidenreich. We can't hear you. No, we can't. I'm sorry, is this better? Yes. Okay, I am going to have to speak right into it, just like, how's that? I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, contract for Katherine Heidenreich Adult Center, and all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Ayes have it, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Turn to the agenda, and as there's a bit, there is another change in the agenda tonight, which is all of our minutes have been put on the consent agenda so that we can expedite our meetings. But 
We are going to do the call to the public. And pardon? Okay, we're going to take a couple of minutes here for people to leave. We'll still have an, we will still have a call to the public if anyone wants to speak. <laughs> Good evening. Let us re return to the meeting. <laughs> and we are now at the call to the public. Comments from the public. Those wishing to address the council should fill out a request form in advance. Action taken as a result of public comments will be limited to directing staff to study the matter or rescheduling the matter for consideration and decision at a later time. Comments from the public will be restricted to items not on the agenda with the exception of those on the consent agenda. There will be no comments allowed that advertise for a particular person or group. Comments should be limited to no more than three minutes. And at this time, uh, we had a lot of people signed up on the item that we just voted on. And I am not going to go through this entire list, but if there's anyone still here who would like to, if there's anyone still here who signed up, and would like to still speak? OK, please come to the podium. Hello. Hello. Let me make sure everybody can hear me, because I could barely hear any of you talking. I know. My name is William McCabe. I have a history. I worked in construction, carpenter for 30 years, inspector, and a superintendent building schools for the public. What I found here is going to businesses is they don't comply with the ADA code for getting in and out of the business. I can barely open doors. Yesterday I took my door tester. 
I checked a couple of buildings. Doctor office, I've been complaining for six months, is 10 pounds. Max is five pounds. That's max, that's double. We go in a restaurant, it's 15 pounds to get in. Most people are not aware of the poundage that it takes to open the door and get in, you know. They'll fight and push against the door. We have codes that are supposed to change that. That's not happening. You bring it up to the people of business, they don't care. We don't own the business, but you're running a business. And to run a business, the customer has to be able to get in and out of the business, you know, and that's not compliant. I went to the building department yesterday, talked to uh, Inspector Dan Deal. He said he'd get back with me. He basically, he called me around five, got back, he was polite, but he told me I need to contact the Department of Justice or Attorney General to get our codes enforced here in Kingman. That's not right. They're on the books, we need to enforce them. The building department does not take complaints. So you can't file a complaint where it's checked out and validated. You know, so there's no enforcement of the codes. There's no way to make a complaint for the code to get it aware. But I can call that somebody is, uh, weeds are six inches high and then that's taken Point, but we have to get in and out of the business. It becomes a fire life safety issue, getting in and out. Above every business door, it will say these doors are to remain unlocked. Well, if they're unlocked, but it's 20 pounds to get in and out, that's not accessible. And somewhere we have to change the building department to take the complaint to follow up to enforce these codes. Doors are maintenance issues and are ongoing and always need to be adjusted. Most door closures, 10, 15 minutes and the person's in and out. It's not a big job to go in there and adjust closures. You know, but. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. But ADA standards are online and on file. But thank you for your time and I appreciate all your efforts that you guys put in. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah, yes. Uh, Manager Foggin, could we have a follow up to this about the complaints for ADA compliance? Yes. <laughs> In the future, as part of a work session. Or do you mean now? Okay. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, so, um, okay, we have someone else sp speaking on call to the public. Uh, please come on up if you'd like to speak. I didn't want to be rude and interrupt anyone. Certainly. I was a teacher and a principal for too many years, and that happened to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to speak on the uh, Catherine Heinrich Adult Center. Um, I'm a volunteer there. I, I teach the sewing classes on Sunday mornings. Sunday. Oh, I'm really off of on Thursday mornings, and uh, it, it it's been my pleasure for a lot of years. I don't even know how many. You'd have to ask Deborah how many. And uh, your consent on that, I I appreciate it a hundred percent. I was going to. I don't know who your fire chief is, but uh, I had. A need for a call two weeks ago. Uh, my fire alarms were going off in my house and they were echoing all over and I called them and grabbed my dog and went outside and they were there just like right now. And uh, the next day uh, they came from the office and, and they checked all of my fire alarms in my house. Oh, nice. and helped me decide which ones were usable and which ones weren't. And um, one more thing about the Katherine Heinrich Adult Center. I lost my husband in September. It was extremely devastating, even though he died from what they call Lewy body dementia, which is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and everything all put to together. 
and I was his 24-7 caregiver. When he died, it was extremely devastating for me. Number one, I'd feel over in the bed and he wasn't there. And uh, number two, I'd go to the senior center every day. And that's what kept my sanity in my head, was all of my friends there that I could speak with, that I could relax with, uh, laugh with, and I, I, I'm now back to a laughing person, and that's my personality. It's not one of these down, you know, I always try to see the good and everything. And uh, I just want to thank you for voting to support the center. Um, I don't know what I'd have done right after my husband died, even though I have children, but they all have to go to work. <laughs> and an empty house is echoes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm leaving that. now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, being I'm sorry, here. Could you state your name, please? Mary Johnson. Yes, ma'am. We have another speaker. Thank you. This is my good friend. <laughs> Thank you for hearing me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I Could you give us your name, please? My name is Carol Duckworth, D-U-C-K-W-O-R-T-H. I'm always asked how to spell it. <laughs> I've had lots of things written down because of the awesomeness of the adult center, and it's the only thing we've got here. But what I wanted to add to hers, is a psychological help. And when adults leave the workforce, which all of you will someday, it's you lose your confidence, you leave your self-esteem, you lose so much. And like she said, grieving, it helps the people that, that are grieving so much. But going there helps our, our feeling of self-esteem, our worthiness, our confidence, everything. It helps our brains kind of keep working too. So please think of this in two years, how important this is. It's not just games. They have over 200 activities a month. It's just, you know, you know all this. But thank you. But think of the psychological that it does for us. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for You're sharing. Welcome. Thank you. The person that has signed up to speak is Henry Varga. Welcome, Mr. Varga. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have signed up to speak for the Heidenreich Center, and I will in a moment. I also signed up for the call of the public, so maybe I'm the transition between the two. Uh, I'm a member of the board of directors of the Heidenreich Center. I've been for several years. I appreciate beyond measure your moving the item to the front of the agenda. You all benefit from that, so the lack of noise and the congestion. And I appreciate your swift handling and appropriate handling of that matter. It is, I have found it to be very valuable service for the community. And the city is an essential partner to that. Having said that, I, I will then transition to my other item I wanted to address the council with since I'm here. Uh, and it's loosely speaking uh, a, a takeoff, a tangential comment to the recent election pertaining to our sales tax that we have for infrastructure. Now, I think it's commonly known all the construction that was taking place from the, those funds that were raised. There are questions, some of them valid questions, on how big the tax was and some other issues. And the public generally is against taxes and anything on the agenda that gives the public a chance to vote against a tax, most of the time they will. However, I want to address something as an alternative view of this. And that is, one of the big issues that causes a city infrastructure to need increased maintenance, a repair, and more expensively replacement or expansion, is the additional demands made upon that infrastructure. And those additional demands come from two sources an increased population, and increased outside commercial activity that's coming into the community to, to uh, 
use our infrastructure. That includes all the people that live near the city but outside the city, and we have a lot of those in our particular community. So how do they participate, these two groups, in helping to offset the cost of our infrastructure requirements to maintain, repair, replace, or expand? And since the sales tax was presented and now has been removed, uh, and personally, I thought that at least a part of that sales tax should have remained, and the council has now been saddled further, I think inappropriately, as unfortunately, in my view, personal view, that you can't do it in the future without this public vote, which you're unlikely to get. That leaves only one thing left, in my view, and that is where then can we look to, where can we look, and where is the appropriate place to look for those who have an effect on the infrastructure, and that is the growth. And therefore, I think that the city council really is left with little alternative to address the long-term infrastructure requirements than to return and revisit the issue of the impact fees on the developments and the, con and the new construction. And, and I don't see how you have any other choice. There's an additional argument that goes along with that. I, don't, I have mixed emotions over it, but it goes along with it. Uh, and it is very politically charged statement I'm about to make, and I apologize if I offend anybody, but the, the people who fought the most against the sales tax are the very ones who caused the development. So I think that we should look and say, well, look, unfortunately, folks, you've done this to yourself, and we have to look at the impact fees now and the cost of construction, and to say this is where we've got to get it. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bar. Any questions? Thank you very Thank much. You, Mr. Thank Bar you, Mr. Bar. You're, you're moving that forward on you. Yes. Uh, Manager Foggin, I know we've had this as part of our workshop sessions, and I expect that that will be returning to uh, for our continued discussion prior to the budget being adopted. Thank you. I don't have anyone else signed up for call to the public. Was there anyone else that wanted to address the council? Then we will move on to the consent agenda. We will move on to the consent agenda. We're gonna have to improve these mics. <laughs> uh, all matters here are listed to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is desired, the, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Does any, do, uh, do any of the council members want to remove any of the consent agenda items from the consent agenda for consideration? Given that, I would entertain a motion for uh, a approval of the consent agenda items A through N. That includes all of the minutes from our May 7th and 9th work sessions and regular minutes. I move that we approve the consent agenda items A through N. There's I'll second that, Mayor. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Old business. 4A. Resolution number 5205, adopting policy guidelines and application procedures for the establishment of community facilities district. On April 16th, 2019, a draft of policy guidelines and application procedures for the establishment of community facility districts was presented to the City Council. James Gill of Gus Rosenfeld will provide the Council with an overview of the newly drafted policy guidelines and application procedures and highlight significant changes made. Council's requested revisions to the original draft will be discussed for further consideration. Staff recommends approval of resolution establish number 5205 adopting policy guidelines and application procedures for the establishment of a community facilities districts good evening please 
come forth and walk us through this. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us back for the records. The clerk's happy with me. My name's Andrew McGuire. I'm an attorney with Gus Rosenfeld. Tonight with me is Jim Giel. He's a partner of mine in the Public Finance Department. You may have heard Jim's name uh, thrown about as we've been talking about CFDs. He does a lot of that work for our firm as well. Um, the policies that you had presented to you about a month ago were a version of the CFD policies that we created a while ago with some, some changes. And so what you have in front of you tonight is going to be familiar but modified because we've had quite a few CFDs that we've formed over the years and we've tweaked the, the policies to adjust to the law. There's been some significant changes in the last two years, but more importantly to adjust to the realities of the CFDs take you back a little ways. When CFDs first were formed, you know, we're over 20 years ago now, there was really no guidance whatsoever in the state. And so they sat dormant for quite a while. Nobody really formed many. But once cities started getting interested in them, and more importantly, once the development community in the state wanted to get involved uh, in utilizing what is a very valuable financing tool to them, we had to come up with a set of guidelines that would do two things. One, it would give you all the direction to the development community of what you're expecting and to give you all an understanding of what the, the financing tool will do and how it works. And so the, the policies you have here are a blend of a few things. Some of them are best practices that we've determined uh, help you, help us get all the information necessary to try and figure out how this is going to work. A lot of it is uh, to provide information to people who would be in contact with a CFD in one way or another. Um, right now, the, the two different kinds you're discussing are very, very different types of CFDs. The typical one is formed with a single or just a few owners who sign a waiver and you have formation without the, the process of an election. Information among the people involved in a CFD in that case is kind of simple because everybody's on the same page. They're all your applicants. They're applying to you. Uh, a little more difficult when you have property owners who are not the applicants and then you have a lot more moving parts. You have an election, so you have the need to provide them with information. The policies we have here are simply your direction to us and the development community on what you want us to provide you in order to make the decision on whether or not you're going to approve this financing tool for the development community to use. It is not set in stone. But it is, uh, we represent a, a large majority, I believe, of the CFDs in the state. And so this is fairly consistent with what has been done across the state. So it's, it's not new ground for us. It's just that this is a revision to what you originally had that was a little bit older. Um, in the end, it's policy direction. That's what we're here for from you all. So we are happy to take comments on whatever you, it is you'd want to discuss. Jim is going to... Uh, be available to walk you through page by page or just high level comments, whatever you want to do, specific sections. I'll be here to answer any questions you have as well, but you know, I, we certainly don't want to uh, take any more time, Mayor, than, than you need to, but we'll be here as long as you want. Thank you. So, how would you like to proceed for us? I'm not loud enough, is that what you're telling me? I'd like to discuss the, the 1.10, which is now 1.8, the governing board. Um, my biggest concern with all of that put together um, is that at, at the sole and absolute discretion of the CFD board, which I can appreciate that the council is involved, I can appreciate that two entities uh, of the major player is involved, um, but what it sounds to me like is an old airport authority that we've lived through. So I want to make sure that that is not the case. <laughs> Madam Mayor, Councilman Nelson, I, I don't know if I can guarantee you it's not the old Probably airport not. authority. Probably not. I understand that. Um, <laughs> but I know what you mean by that. Um, the, the CFD board up until two years ago was the seven of you. 
there, there was no distinction. There were only two CFDs formed in the state with a private board. And so almost every one of them that's been formed is always the council members who simply are turning the hat around and becoming the CFD board and issuing debt. And it's hard for your citizens to recognize the difference between council member and board member. And so a lot of times the two get conflated. And really more so at this time of year when you're adopting budgets, you will adopt your budget along with the CFD budget at the same time. When your auditors come to do the audit, they're going to do a single audit of everything together, even though they are two political subdivisions. So even though the board has that kind of discretion, its discretion is necessary because the citizens who are member, who are residents of the CFD or property owners of the CFD who are going to be paying the taxes, look to the seven of you to defend their interests. And for the seven of you to understand that the consequences coming back to you, if, they're, if they feel they're treated unfairly, may come back to the city, even though the city has no direct liability for the CFD. And so you will see throughout here, and it's certainly something that you all can decide to change. We have reserved absolute discretion to the, the board, and in this case, seven-ninths of you are here right now, because of the significance of the tool that you're using. This is a very powerful financing tool, and if it wasn't favorable to development, they wouldn't be pushing for it. It's, it's just a, it's a tremendous uh, benefit and can be quite a burden. Some of the things you see in there, like the debt ratios, are intended to ensure that the property doesn't get overburdened and then put you all in the position with right. your city hats on of not being able to do anything else. Because and that you, is the next concern as well, making <laughs> sure that the city is covered because frankly, a developer is gonna be just fine. In their end, they will be just fine. They'll figure it out. We don't need to be 20 years from now going, wow, we're still straddled with a few issues, aren't we? Because there are a few cities in town in the state that have that issue. So we do want to be careful with that. So that's where that concern comes from. Fair enough. Thank you. I, I would just have a couple of questions, if, if I may. Okay. First with um, 1.7. Mm -hmm. uh, and forgive me, but I, I can't find the statutory basis for the language that's in 1.7, maybe you could explain to me where that's at. Oh, absolutely, Mr. Vice Mayor. This 1.7 is what I, I will refer to, and I'll let Jim jump up if he disagrees with me, as the skin in the game provision. Because of this financing tool providing such a huge benefit to the developer who's enabled to use it, this is ensuring that they bring sufficient financing and their own financing to the table to try and make sure that everybody's investment's equal. Because as Councilor Nelson hit it on the head, if you do not have a successful CFD, the developer really isn't going to suffer much. The single purpose entity that was part of the development agreement will typically be gone. Everyone will leave and you all are still here with a failed CFD and angry people. So this is intended to make sure that the players are serious. Now that number is not set in stone at 25 cents per, was it? 25 per one dollar, I can't read at this point, that that you know, one to four ratio is not necessarily in, set in stone, but that is consistent with every other CFD policy that we have. Before they went to Wall Street, you would have to have somebody that was serious, right? Because <laughs> Wall Street's just not going to throw money at a project and with no expectation of getting paid back, right? Well, uh, it looks like there's language in here that was added that it's subject to negotiation. There's a little bit of flex, so I appreciate that. Yes. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, Article 1.10, and I'm going to reference 4.7. So um, in reading Article 1.10, it says, um, uh, the CFD board will determine in its sole and absolute discretion the amount, timing, and form of financing to be used by a CFD. But then if you look, uh, in 4.7, uh, since the CFD board doesn't exist at the time of application, why then does Article 4.7 require that a completed application require the information in 4.7a through 4.7g? Uh, the applicant doesn't even know what form of financing the future CFD board will, in its sole discretion, choose as its financing method. So it, it's just a little confusing, and it seems like it. There could be a little di di different language there, like maybe prior to the issuance of assessment bonds or something like that. Could you? Um, 
Absolutely, and Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Jim and I actually had a conversation about this yesterday in my office that after we saw the question on that issue, on a CFD that's going to be one or two members and they're all signing a waiver on the front end and we don't have an election, I think that, that that's a reasonable position to mm -hmm. say that we don't really need to know what kind of, of debt you're going to issue on the front end. We just need to know how much debt you want to issue so that the seven of you, along with the two other board members, can determine, does that make sense for the CFD? Are you issuing too much debt? Is it too much of a burden? Yeah. The mechanism, whether it's an assessment bond, whether it's geo bonds, right. really doesn't matter at that point. In a, an election version, however, mm -hmm. now we have property owners who are not part of the game. They are just going to be asked to vote to form this financing mechanism to tax themselves in order to build infrastructure. Without that information, they may not have enough information to be able to make the call on whether or not it's feasible. So I, I think there's, there's definitely a different approach that might happen because of the types of CFDs that are formed. And it's a challenge when you're doing a policy that's directed mainly at the developers are all in the room version sure. and not the, the version we're talking about otherwise. That makes sense to me. Thanks. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments regarding the policy, proposed policy? I would entertain a motion regarding approval of Resolution 5205, adopting policy guidelines and application procedures for the establishment of a community facilities district. districts. So moved. I have a, a motion to adopt these guidelines. Do I have a second? We'll discuss after I get a second. I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the policy guidelines and application procedures for establishment of community facilities districts. Discussion, please. Councilman. Actually, there was someone in the, in the audience waving for discussion. He didn't realize. Ah. Sorry. OK. Uh, I am good. This is not a public hearing, but I can still entertain comments. So I'll do it during our period of discussion. Please come forth, Mr. Engel. Hi, Mayor and uh, members of council. My name is Tyler Engel, the president of Engel Homes here in uh, Kingman. We build homes and do developments. I just had a couple of questions on uh, how the CFDs work. Um, the first question is what, what land they're allowed to go over. So if theoretically I have a subdivision that has multiple phases and say one phase is done, the homes are there, the second phase is halfway built out with homes, and then the third phase, let's say I'm putting in the streets right now, and then an applicant brings an, an application for a CFD, can that go over all three phases or, or none of those phases or, or only vacant land or unplatted land? I'm not sure. Mr. Cooper, uh, is it okay for us to have this answered? Okay. Yeah. If you would, please come up and answer that. <laughs> Madam Mayor, uh, uh, members of the council, Jim Giel with Gus Rosenfeld. Very good question. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the answer is, um, again, at the, school, at the sole discretion of uh, the CFD board, a CFD may be permitted uh, and allow different types of property within a CFD at different phases of development. But again, that would be at your sole and absolute discretion. Uh, but that would not be uncommon uh, to do it that way. Um, and the preferred approach generally is to include as much land as possible uh, that's being developed in a similar manner in the same CFD. Uh, so uh, what the gentleman is describing could work, uh, obviously depending on lots of details. But, but yes, that would be uh, permissible. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, then on, I was looking through the version, uh, yesterday's versions, which I think is the latest resolution. And in the 1.7 that, that, uh, Vice Mayor Lingenfelter was bringing up, the way it's worded, it seems like the skin in the game paragraph could be nullified because it says, unless otherwise agreed in the development agreement. So there could be a development agreement theoretically that was lower than the 25 cents per dollar, um, and, and I kind of like the 25 cents because, you know, developers such as myself has skin in the game. They're, they're committed where 
where this uh, says unless otherwise agreed could be anything. So maybe we could reword that to say a minimum of 25 cents or, or more or something like that um, um, in, in the development agreement was, was one suggestion I had. And then the other, other change in yesterday's version in 4.9 was it was changed from the applicant to pay the cost of the insurance related to the bonds, I guess. That was changed to be paid by the CFD itself and was wondering what, what brought about that change and which one of those is, is uh, commonplace, I guess, who, who normally pays the insurance and why why it was changed to be the CFD. Thanks. Do we have a response, please? Absolutely, I'll take the second one first. And as you, actually, it's the cost of issuance. Uh, there may be insurance associated with a, any particular bond issue, but generally we talk about the cost of issuance, uh, to pay the professionals, to pay the bankers, to sell the bonds, uh, things of that nature. And the norm is how we have it reflected in these revised guidelines. The default is that we use bond proceeds to pay cost of issuance. That is the norm throughout the state for any bond issue, whether it's a city bond issue, a school bond issue, or other CFDs. There are a few exceptions. Some cities believe it to be important that every penny of bonds they sell, for example, if they sell $10 million of bonds for a CFD, they want $10 million going in the project fund to the penny. And then they say, hey, developer, we're doing this as an economic development tool for your benefit. You, therefore, shall pay the cost of issuance whatever that might be, you know, typically two, three hundred thousand uh, dollars That would be unusual, but it is done on a regular basis uh, for at least one of our clients. That's just the position they've taken. You're obviously free to disagree with that. And the guidelines before you tonight have that norm, uh, again, where, where we use bond proceeds to, uh, to pay cost of issuance. So the, the norm is that it's a district or a, a district, a CFD expense. A district I, expense. I, 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 Yes, that's one way to put it. It is, it is an expense paid from bond proceeds. Uh, the, the bonds are ultimately supported by uh, special assessments and, and or property taxes paid by property owners within the CFD. Great. So it's a one-time, non-reoccurring expense. Great. And I apologize, I've already forgotten the first question that, that was posed. It was about 1.7. 1.7. I think it was primarily about wanting it to be more than 25. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, um, I, I think Andrew touched on that section. Um, that, that is covered. Uh, well, the idea here is that, again, we want to give you, as the CFD board, the maximum flexibility. So because we're trying to address, with this set of guidelines, projects with one developer and projects with 100 homeowners or landowners, excuse me, um, Depending on what project approaches uh, comes to the CFD and when, you may have a development agreement. And at, at the development agreement is when you can negotiate with the developer what they'll pay, you know, what their contribution might be, so to speak. And it could be more. It could be less than 25%. It's, it's, it's really at your discretion. There's no hard and set rule. What you're seeing in these guidelines is the custom. Um, but there have been cases. Uh, throughout the state that have deviated from that. Again, depending on the deal, because folks recognize that one size truly doesn't fit all, and there may be a project that just makes more sense for you, and you may be willing to bend a little bit on that. So that we feel it's worded in an appropriate manner to give you the flexibility to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, I, I couldn't find this specific clause linked to the statute, and so this, in addition to anything else that the CFD would want to negotiate and, and, or, or conditions that they would want to put on to a CFD, um, that's all up to subject to negotiation, right? That is largely the case. I mean, the, as Andrew mentioned, the, the purpose of the guidelines is to let the development community know how the city council thinks about development as it relates to CFDs. So it's sort of a starting point. Um, in some cases, it's also the end point. Mm -hmm. Some of these CFDs that I've worked on have been very straightforward, and you don't we don't have to move one way or the other, and we get them done within, from start to finish, six months. That is not the norm. Um, and the, the project I've heard described uh, for your city is absolutely unusual in terms of 100 plus landowners. So that is not a six month project. I think you all know that. Um, that will take lots of coordination. In, in my experience, the largest uh, project my firm has worked on in terms of coordinating with different developers is 18. 
And that, in and of itself, was very unusual and took a ton of coordination over a one-year-plus period with, with a group, with a development group that came together to sign every document and, you know, with out-of-state entities and lien holders and a real headache. But that's not the norm either. The norm is one or two developers, typically one, and, and they vote on it up front, or I'm sorry, they submit a petition up front. We waive elections, we waive lots of stuff, notices, publications, and we can move quickly. That's, that's the easiest method, but obviously you take what, what you get. Thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up to that, if Absolutely. I may. Absolutely, go ahead. Um, I apologize. Um, with respect to 1.7, um, I'm trying to justify a scenario wherein it would be appropriate to, um, I guess, uh, with respect to the point two five for in infrastructure community improvements, where it would be appropriate to go any less than that. In your experience, is there a scenario where that would be appropriate? I, I, I can think of uh, many scenarios wherein maybe somebody would want to see you know, a higher one in you know, riskier situations right. or, or whatever. Yeah. But. To, the, to the extent I've seen less, it's maybe been 20%. I mean, that 25% is, is fairly arbitrary. I mean, there's no magic. The rating agencies from the bond rating agency companies aren't telling us that. No one's telling us that. Um, it has sort of become the norm in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, but you could certainly make an argument for a little less, just like you could for more, uh, okay. just depending on the nature of the project. So that's why we, we, we try to build in that discretion. But we have, but, we, but you are sending, if, assuming you adopt the guidelines, you're sending a message, this is what you expect to see, um, and if you, if you developer are going to come in with something less, tell us the story. Explain why it makes sense for the community. Thank you. Any other discussion or comments, questions about this item? Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. You had, you had mentioned that 25% is the norm. Granted, the fact that your firm has only worked on up to 18 participants, and now this one might could turn into, for example, uh, the possibility of 100, doesn't that make that more tenuous and also more somewhat more risky, would you say? Well, um, I, I think the risk is is up front as and I shouldn't I don't even know if I'd describe it as risk. It's a lot of coordination. Okay. Um, this is very different, so we kind of have to think about it a little differently. Um, the expectation, I think, would be that we would have at least because the statute requires it twenty five percent of the landowners coming to, to to the city with a petition because that's the minimum for the. But uh, in the more normal course, we would have a hundred percent. So obviously, that's that's different right there. Um, so 25% is the minimum. Hopefully we get 50%. That would make things easier if we had 50% of the landowners coming on that petition up front. Uh, because then we know that we have some certainty when we, uh, when we have to go out and do the election uh, for the formation. Uh, and then the subsequent election to actually get bonds issued. So it's the more we can creep over closer to that 50%. But to your point, you know, and we've been referring to it as sort of the hundredth landowner in the district who may have two acres and you know and is not going to be along for this but ultimately they will have imposed upon them a, a special assessment or a property tax depending on how any particular project goes and they will have to pay it uh, to support the bonds and to support the development but i would i would assume that you you want to avoid that as much as possible because then again that is not the norm the norm is that the person uh, accepting that tax is at the table up front with you, and it's it's an exchange. They're you know they're, they're getting their project in exchange for your bond proceeds to get re partially reimbursed for that project. Uh, that's the exchange. But the hundredth landowner may not feel that way. So you ultimately will have to answer to that. So that's why we all have to be a little more sensitive, given the nature of this initial project. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd call it more tenuous, but it's certainly um, uh, it's it's more work up front with coordination, and I I would expect that it would be more work for the for the developer, uh, the master developer or the the lead developer to kind of wrangle everyone together or at least a majority. Thank you. Any other comments? Any discussion? Uh, okay, then I would entertain a motion regarding I the motion. We motion, motion and a second. Well, pardon? Oh, we have the motion and a second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. 
to approve. There's been so much discussion. That's good. Uh, so we have a motion and a second to approve uh, the resolution 5205, adopting policy guidelines and application procedures for the establishment of a community facility of community facility districts. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move on to new business. Uh, resolution number 5214, adopting a pension funding policy. The state of Arizona's public safety personnel retirement system is as a whole underfunded. The city of Kingman's police and fire trust funds are underfunded by close to 50% or 30.2 million dollars. In an effort to not only comply with legislation but to communicate the council's commitment towards sound financial management of the city, the pension funding policy will be taken to achieve a 100% funded status of its pension liability by June 30th, 2036. Staff recommends council approve Resolution number 5214, adopting a pension funding policy. Manager Foggin, oh, or Director Moline. Ms. Yes. Tina Moline. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So we've been talking about PSPRS and our unfunded pension uh, liability for quite some time. And we know that by July 1st of 2019, we have to adopt a pension funding policy. And that policy not only communicates that you recognize that we have that unfunded pension liability, but your commitment to address it as well. And so in the pension funding, uh, the pension funding policy, we are required to identify our funding ratio goal, the date that we plan on attaining that, and then how we plan on attaining that goal. So the pension funding policy in front of you or in your packets states that our funding ratio goal is 100% by June 2036. And there are several actions that we will take to meet that goal by that date. And one of those is to maintain our annual required contribution, which we're doing, and we're gonna to continue to do that. We're also going to prepay all of those payments as well as prepay our budgeted PSPRS expenditures, so above and beyond that annual required contribution. And then as we talked in April um, about fund balance and what we wanted to do with excess fund balance, we talked about using one-time monies from the general fund, if the general fund allowed, to pay down that liability. And so specifically, and I just want to be sure that I make it very clear what we included in the policy, specifically, we state, or we're including in the policy, that the City Council will dedicate a one-time payment towards paying down the City's unfunded pension liability each fiscal year as part of the adopted budget if the General Fund's budgeted fund balance exceeds 40% of its budgeted expenditures and outgoing transfers. And so that was one of the questions that Vice Mayor Lingenfelter has had posed um, during our budget work sessions is how can we communicate that? And so that this is a very specific, but also allows flexibility so that we're not required to make that payment if the fund balance doesn't allow. And we don't have to alter our fund balance policy because now this is included in our pension funding policy. So we're required to review this every year and we are also required to adopt the policy every year and then post it on our website so um, I will entertain any questions or um, and if not staff recommends approval of this resolution questions for director Moline thank you thank you very much I appreciate you putting this in a formal document that really substantiates for the future how this will work and uh, against that, I would entertain a motion regarding resolution uh, 5214, the fund adopting a pension funding policy. I'll move that we, re we accept. I have a the motion. Resolution. I have a motion to second. accept. We have a second, a motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion? Then all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, motion carries. Thank you. 
Item 5B, Airport Hangar Lease Discussion. The Airport Advisory Commission has been evaluating a 3% increase to hangar leases at the Kingman Municipal Airport. The Commission has recommended that Council freeze any increases to the monthly hangar leases until a rate study can be completed in fiscal year 2019-2020. Manager Foggin, who's, oh, Mr. Johnston. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council. For quite a number of years, uh, the hangars, the rental hangars at the airport have had an automatic 3% increase on rent. Um, now again, when we're talking just a few years, that's not a major issue, but in many instances, when you look at the age of these buildings, we're talking over 10 years, in some cases close to 20. Uh, and so the hangar rents have gone up. One of the things staff has uh, recommended to the airport advisory board is putting this on hold uh, for a year and going out and doing a survey of all the other airports in state and see from an inflationary standpoint uh, or inflationary kicker standpoint what other people are doing, what the minimum and maximum limits are, and what the time frames are. Is it every year? Is it every three years? Is it every five years? Um, and that's the, the history behind that. And again, the Airport Advisory uh, Commission, and I apologize when I say board, coming from a different city, I get mixed up. <laughs> um, they have uh, um, requested that on those monthly hangar uh, leases that we freeze it, that we study it, and then uh, staff come back to them with uh, a survey and uh, an idea of what path they want to take. Any questions? Thank you. Questions? Have, yeah, oh, just a Vice couple. Mayor? I'm sorry. No, yeah. Go ahead, okay. go ahead. Vice Mayor. Go ahead. You first, please. Thanks. Um, Steve, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, if I remember right, when the city took over the airport last year, didn't, they, didn't we freeze it last year also? The rates or did it increase already? Come fiscal year. I don't you believe it was frozen. It's not frozen. We, did, we continued them as they were. They, okay. They, yeah. Okay, so that's why I just wanted to clarify. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would su I'd support this. Um, I know that when we took it over, one of the things that I had asked um, the prior managers was, what are you basing that 3% on? I mean, what is that based on? Um, and, and it really wasn't based on anything. It just seemed to be sort of a 3% that they had somehow just grabbed out of the air. So. Um, I think this is appropriate, and, and I would hope that uh, whatever the recommendations are that come back, that they would re you, the, this study would recommend some sort of formula or something to to really, you know, sh serve as the basis for a recommendation of an increase, um, rather than just being it's, it's three percent because it's three percent and it's always been three percent, so it's going to continue to be three percent. Something a little more than that. Other other well. My most recent uh, other airport, uh, the dynamic there was it was based on the Phoenix CPI. Sure. Uh, and then there was a low example. limit and right. a high limit. Right. Uh, but something that developers and hangar owners and others could basically bank on right. in future. Something logical, right? Yes. And, and can I jump in real quick? Just when we took over, I, I started rewriting all of the, 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 the new leases, and it is tied to a, 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 an, an indicator that I got from the finance department. So the new leases are... Your modifications are. Correct. The modifications of the rate will be okay. tied to a, a, an indicator. I just don't remember which one it was off the top of my head. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Yes. Councilwoman Staley. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a couple comments to the council. As the airport commission liaison, um, this commission has been discussing this issue for quite some time now. Um, they've they have already called a lot of the different airports in the state, and so I think it's important to know that our lease rates are already on the high side compared to some of the other airports of uh, considerable size and size cities. Um, the, other, the other thing that really bothers me is that there uh, seems to be different lease rates for different people. So there, there was not... Um, it wasn't set on size or any of these other things. It's just a lot of different people pay a lot of different prices. And the city is going to have to do this study in order to 
uh, make it fair so that everybody's paying the same uh, type of lease rates across the board instead of based on whatever they used to base it off of. So I am absolutely in favor of, of freezing this 3% increase until we can get our arms around the lease rates in general, all these different facets, and find out um, what our rates need to be to be competitive on top of that. So, you know, I know that we've talked, we talk about, in the, 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 the commission talks about building more hangars because um, they are all booked up and, and there's demand for more and, it, and it's something that would bring more revenue. Um, but when we do that, we also need to make sure that we're charging a fair price and that our leases are strong and um, that we can, we can fill those up with, with a good rate. So that's just my two cents from the commission. Councilman White. A uh, quick question. Um, do we have an estimated timeline um, for when we can get the study conducted and finished? Uh, it would be a priority. Uh, the idea is to come back to, uh, well, to have something back to the airport board as soon as possible, but again, to have something in hand uh, that's come back to the council prior to next year's budget session, so within a year. Uh, both the study, uh, a recommendation to the airport board, and then something back to you. And will that study include sort of a, I guess, a list of criteria as to how these rates are applied to the different hangars and sizes and all, and all that stuff? Yes, uh, simply. I, I could go into much more detail, but this is not the time or the place. Right. Okay. Thank you. I guess my only comment is I appreciate the work that you are doing and that the commission is doing, working together with you to make these recommendations because I know this is a very productive relationship that is uh, occurring at the airport, and uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, against that, I would ask to, uh, I would entertain a motion on freezing any increases to monthly hangar leases until a rate study can be completed and brought back to Council, I'd I, like to. Oh, sorry. You want to discuss? I just wanted to make the motion. Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that we freeze the three percent increase on the hangar leases. Could I have a second? A second. I second. <laughs> Councilman, <laughs> I, Councilman Watkins, second. Uh, any discussion? Any further discussion on this item? Then all in favor of this motion and second. Aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Final uh, new business is consideration mm. of canceling the August 20, 2019 work session and regular meeting. The League of Arizona Cities and Towns Annual Conference will be held in Tucson August 20th through 23rd, 2019. Due to the timing of the conference and the travel required for both the council and city staff, staff is recommending that the council cancel the work session and regular meeting of August 20th, 2019. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, so I would entertain a motion on this item to cancel the August 20th, 2019 work session and regular meeting. I motion that we cancel. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to all jump in. Yeah. Let's just do this. <laughs> I have a motion. Said. Do I have a second? It's pretty yes. simple. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and second to cancel the August 20th work session and regular meeting. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. Now, item six <laughs> golf course update. Mr. Mearsman. Good evening. Uh, Again, uh, I'll try to be quick because it's been a, kind of a long evening. So this is going to be an update on the golf course. Uh, uh, basically, it's been a very smooth transition so far, thanks to the finance department, HR department, IT department, uh, and all of the staff we have there. Everybody's done a great job. Our whole team has stepped up. And I've uh, invited uh, our golf professional, Greg Pruden, is in the back of the room there, and I invited him here to introduce him to you guys so Good you evening. can put a face with a name, and you can feel free to ask him a question or two when I'm done with this if you, if you 
feel so inclined. So I'll try to get through this. But uh, uh, the pro shop staff, like I said, have stepped up. Haley Bradley has done a great job for us. Denny Martin, Jacob Griffin is a new uh, employee we have there. Has done a really good job. Uh, Shelly Hall in the restaurant, Ernie Dollarhide, and our recreation staff has helped up. Beth Matthews comes over there and helps out still. We're in the process of trying to get some more part-time help. So, But uh, the whole team has uh, stepped up and done a great job. Congratulations to Haley Bradley. She was selected one of four coaches to go to uh, Scotland and represent Arizona coaching the kids to go go play in Scotland. So we're really proud of her for that, and it's a, a great honor. So um, leagues, uh, we've done a good job of getting leagues started back up, the city league and county league. Um, Greg's made contact with the uh, uh, airport businesses and trying to get them started. He's got some feedback from them, and we'd like to see them and possibly the hospital get a league. And uh, he's working real hard and trying to get a lot of that stuff done. So... Um, and like I said, the t team members that have stepped up, uh, Ryan Fruworth had went and worked in the pro shop for a while, and uh, uh, we had a groundskeeper step up and work in the pro shop for a while, uh, and the food and beverage, the go golf course maintenance team did a great job of cleaning, painting. Uh, we put up our uh, logo flag collection, and uh, Haley Bradley had the idea about putting the historic uh, photos up in there, and we uh, put all those up. Patrick Friend did a great job of stepping up, in the, uh, and he's done a great job, I think Greg would tell you, working with him, introducing him to everybody, and uh, did a really good job. So they did a great job of reaching out to all the tournament organizers, uh, talking with our customers. Um, the, with the men's club, that Greg's done a really good job of getting together with them and trying to get them on board. Uh, we evaluated every position and uh, formulated uh, very detailed job descriptions and job duties for each job. And uh, we were looking at the group pricing and trying getting, getting that lined up. Um, we took input from our staff that hears from all the customers about what the needs are, and they've just done a really good job. Here's some photos of the logo flag collection. The befores and afters, what it looked like in there before and what it looks like now. And we've gotten a lot of really nice comments about it. Uh, there's another photo of the area between the patio and the grill. This is the re ladies' restroom. There's the, um, what the sinks used to look like. And our staff did a little remodel in there and put the new sinks in there, and it looks a lot better. And even one of our pool technicians redid the vanity in the ladies. So, I mean, it's just a total team of everybody stepping up and doing a really good job. So... Uh, really pleased with that. Here's some of the historic photos that we found at the a museum and put in the pro shop, and they've getting a lot of interest. I mean, over the weekend, it was, it was our busiest weekend this past weekend was with the Desert Scheffler Tournament, and that event went great. Greg and his staff did a great job. Patrick did a great job. The uh, feedback from them was that everything is excellent, and we're working with them. After every event we have in our, our department, we look at it, is there anything we can do better? And, and we've got them thinking the same thing. Is there anything that we can do better to make that event even better? Um, here's just some more pictures, historic photos. I think they're pretty cool. Um, they're all around the pro shop, like I said, and they're getting a lot of interest. Um, on the golf course, it was a busy winter, basically, with the cleanup from Snowmageddon, a lot of damaged trees, and we lost a, a, a one tree, but a lot of hanging limbs and dangerous situation. We got that cleaned up, and uh, they've leveled two tees over the winter and made those a lot nicer. Number 14, number 17. Um, we've added some cart path extensions. We're trying to get the people, the customers, to get on the cart paths right around the greens and tees because if they pull up right in front of the green, they wear that area out substantially. You know, six carts, and they're all turning the wheels and getting off and turning their feet. It's a lot of damage on the turf, so. Uh, we're constantly trying to work on that. Um, fairways are looking great right now. We oversee a lot of the damaged areas last fall, and they came in great. We just started following the Desert Scheffler Tournament, airifying the greens, which is always a challenging time. You're in there tearing them up after them, and they're looking so beautiful. But you have to do that to really help them get through the season. So um, on to the golf course revenue, which I know everybody's interested in. Basically, if you look at this, we, we're down um, $23,000 in the first quarter, but thanks to Snowmageddon, most of that is. We would actually be up if it wasn't for Snowmageddon. We were closed 
Uh, we, if you look at February, we lost $39,000, and that's from being closed seven days and having, uh, I believe it was four other days that we had only 10 people out there. It was so cold. So the, the, we lost 900 rounds of golf during Snowmageddon, $39,000. We had um, four additional days where only 10 players came out, and I haven't looked at the books, but I'm pretty sure they're probably season pass holders because that's who usually comes out on those really cold days, and not a lot of uh, other people were out. So in the temperatures in February were 13 degrees cooler than they were in uh, 2018, so um, and 10 degrees below the uh, historical average. So um, it was a challenging February, I guess you'd say, with snowmageddon. So. Um, promotions, like I said, Greg's done a really good job with these. Mother's Day, we had mothers golf free on Mother's Day, and we had 10 uh, mothers took advantage of that. And believe it or not, none of them played by themselves. So we think it was a good thing. So, um, And we have Education Appreciation Day, uh, Veterans Appreciation, Lunch and Loop. We've had, uh, and Greg's going to have a clinic, free clinic for adults for the, I'm not sure, first 15 people that signed up for it, I think. But uh so far, we've had over 100 customers take advantage of the specials that we've had. And, uh, you know, if we didn't have those, that'd be 100 less people there. So people are taking advantage of them and um, enjoying it. And we're going to have more to come, obviously. We're continuing to look for ways to get more people out there. Um, we're in the process of talking to our disc golf community and getting disc golf on the golf course and foot golf where you kick a soccer ball and play golf. There's actually a hole with a flag in it, and we've contacted several golf courses that do these things. And what you would do, you would do those later in the day, not in the morning when the, the golf play is heavy, but we're in the process of getting this going too. So like I said, we've got the disc golf community excited about it, and they're going to come out and bring their portable ones, and we're going to lay out the golf nine holes at a time and try it and see. So um, we're pretty excited to see how it will fit in with the, with the golf. So... Um, with that, I want to touch base just a little bit more about the Desert Scheffler Tournament, like how good that was. It was actually, last Friday was our uh, b uh, biggest day revenue-wise of in the past two years. So I think we've got a lot of good going on. And um, like I said, I'd like to just, if anybody has any questions for Greg, I'd like for him to come up and answer them for you because he's done a great job so far, and we're excited to have him. He's a Class A PJ professional. He's a very important part of our operation, and he's fitting in great with the – the Desert Scheffler people are very complimentary about the job he did with their event. So um, just a lot of stuff going good there. So if anybody has any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them or turn it over to Greg. Yes, Councilwoman Staley. Um, first of all, I was in the uh, pro shop this morning signing up for Junior Off, and I was blown away. It looks really nice in there, a big improvement. I haven't been in there probably in about a year, and so – it was just night and day difference, and you can really tell us. So thank you very much for that. Um, my question is, when we we were talking about golf quite some time ago, and we had a lot of people that, that came in, and they, they made comments to the council, one of the things they talked about was in the summertime extending the hours so they could play, you know, until it was dark or close to dark. Are, are they going to be able to do that now? We're definitely going to do that. We're okay. going to start let them start early, sun up to sundown, basically. Uh, we're doing, and we're going to have specials even that would be in the evening, so it'd be less expensive for them to play. Because you know, when it gets really, really hot here, a lot of people don't want to come out and play. So we want to try to encourage them to come out, and so we'll have some special pricing that will end up getting people out later in the day. So we're, we're looking, and Greg's on board with doing all that, and he's excited about it as we are. So I mean, we think it's important to get people out there. I mean, who doesn't want to play when it's a lot cooler in the morning? So we're going to let them get out there, sun up. We're not. Okay. We're not going to keep them till seven or eight, six o'clock or whatever. It's four o'clock, and they want to get out there. We're going to let them get out there. So, great, wow. thank you. Excellent, Vice Mayor. Yeah. Um, well, first, I just wanted to say before uh, I got here, was driving, coming into the meeting, uh, I wasn't driving. I was at home. But I got a call from Patrick Moore, a friend of mine that was uh, in the tournament, and had nothing but good things to say. So, thank you for that. Um, and then, just curious, does your uh, the pro does he give? Lessons? Sure. He yeah. does give lessons. He's very good at it. He's got a lot of great experience. I mean, we really got lucky. I mean, he's uh, something else exciting to me about him is he, for six, seven years, I believe it is, he was a, a writer for the PGA magazine, PGA of America magazine. So while he was doing that, he was basically traveling the country, seeing a lot of really, really 
awesome places, a lot of awesome municipal golf courses, a lot of great pr private golf courses. But So, I mean, he's got a lot of experience that he's going to be able to bring to us and uh, really take, take us to the next level. I don't think there's any question about it. So, We are glad you're in Kingman. Thank you so much. <laughs> any other comments? Just yes. a comment, uh, Mike, it, the course is beautiful. In fact, when you come from downtown up on the freeway, you look over that beautiful, I mean, the course looks, is just amazing right now. I wish we could have a course on the north side of the freeway. To make, <laughs> because when people, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah. When, when people come into plans. town, from, you know, when they're plans. coming from downtown or from California, that's one of the first things they see when they get off the freeway. It, it's, it's beautiful. So thank, thank you very much. Appreciate all the hard work you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. I just I, I just okay. want to tell you thank you Mike you you're doing great work I appreciate all you do and you're Johnny on the spot there's no I in team home. though it's, it takes the whole effort and, and yes. I said that earlier I mean the pool maintenance guy did the bathroom vanity so I mean yeah. it's our whole team stepping up so yeah that's it's, wonderful it's exciting thank you <laughs> thank you thank you okay um Announcements by mayor, city mem uh, council members, or a city manager limited to announcements, board and commission liaison reports, availability and attendance at conferences and seminars. Uh, manager Foggin, would you like you have? You don't want to talk. <laughs> 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 he wouldn't tell us if he had something. Okay. <laughs> uh, Councilman Watkins. Nothing. Thank you, Mayor. Nothing. Councilman Wait. Um, yes, I attended the airport commission meeting, um, and I think I went over probably the most important part was just about the, the leases and, and trying to get uh, a fair amount to everybody. And also, um, I, I will be attending the Local First Economic Development Forum August uh, 8th and 9th, and I'll be speaking on um, public art and economic development. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for. Uh, sorry, I missed today's last uh, last meeting time. That was a little bit of an interesting time in my life. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. I'm actually going to be missing a planning and zoning time in the next week. So, Captain uh, Watkins will take them up, but if someone's there, we'll take the planning and zoning time. I greatly appreciate having someone sit down and uh, graduations around the world about. So, and then the other one will be um, planning and zoning. It will be uh, have a couple of things coming forward to us that um, I would like all of us to approach our planning and zoning commissioners and ask them to um, one or two of them to attend. It's nice to hear from our staff. Uh, we need to hear from our staff. They they keep us on the straight and narrow. But every once in a while, it really is nice to hear from one of our commissioners that are doing the same thing we're doing. Only they're supposed to be in front of us. Thank you. Uh, I attended the CAMA meeting today, and they are, um, I think, kicking off a membership drive. I think they have about 44 companies uh, and people that are members right now, I think. Is, is that about right? And, and they're looking to get some new blood and new, new people in there. So if you're interested in, in CAMA and the industry and growing manufacturing and, and the jobs in our region, it's a great organization. And... Uh, we we'll just encourage you to get involved. The only thing I would mention is our City Services Expo. There you go. And that is on uh, May 30th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And is it in Lo Locomotive? At Locomotive Park. This is going to be a real opportunity for 
anyone and all of us to learn about what's going on in all of our departments because they'll all be represented. The city council, we will be, we will have a table there. And I think it'll just be a really wonderful time for, for anyone who wants to talk with us about what's going on in the city and how we serve the city uh, to find out some, to ask some questions and get some answers. So please put that on your calendars. And um, so with that, I think that ends our announcements and we will go into council requests for future work session agenda items and or calendar adjustments. Do we have any requests for work session agenda items at this time? Or calendar adjustments? I would ask, I know it's, um, I, th I think it would be a work session, well maybe not a work session, but I know that we're gonna be having a council um, commissions Work session or workshop in uh, in, June. in June. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. So that will be that. That will need to be promoted, but that will be a time when the council and our commission commissioners will have a chance to meet together and discuss our goals and aspirations for the city. <laughs> Speak. I was. Got, I didn't think it had. So sorry. We're trying. We know. <laughs> I'll speak for Mr. Fogg, and we're trying to finalize a location and a date, and we'll let you guys know as soon as we have that. Okay. Thank you. Madam Next? Chair. Yes, sir. Um, you had mentioned about bringing up a topic or something for future work sessions. Any thoughts from the council about? It seems like it's getting worse about people parking their cars in their front yards as opposed to using. Maybe it's because they have multiple cars, but many cars, and clogging up their front yards. So their front yard—it looks like a I parking know, lot, I know exactly as opposed what you to mean. just. You guys can't talk about it, so correct. We, but I think we could request we, we could request a work session on it. You though. can, right? And I think that's where the councilman is going. I think we'd like a work session on that. Okay, We've got it. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Then we will. Proceed to an executive session, which, uh, do we need a motion to go into executive? Yes, okay, let us have a motion to go into executive session to discuss and evaluate the city manager. Motion for executive session. I'll second that. Motion is second to go into executive session. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Just call this meeting back to order, and um, I would entertain a motion regarding the contract for City Manager Foggen. I would motion that we continue the contract that is set with the increase that the city, all the city employees are going to receive with that same at that same level. Starting at, July. 1st. Starting okay. starting July first this next fiscal year. So. There, do I have a second? I'll second. I have a motion and a second to continue the city manager's contract with an increase in salary that matches that of the employees in the final budget uh, that will become effective July 1st, 2019. All in favor, aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Manager Foggen. And I will go on record saying we really appreciate all the work you've done this past year. You've been an asset to this city. You're a great team leader, and we really appreciate having you here. I love being here, and thank you, Mayor. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It really it is. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and second to adjourn. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Good night. <laughs>